So without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Tom Walters from the Small Robot Company. He's their Chief Technology Officer, and it uh, bodes to be a, a, an excellent talk. So I'll hand it straight over to Tom. Thank you, uh, and good evening, everyone. Um, so, yes, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, some robot companies' um, sort of model of doing per plant farming. Um, the The idea is to move away from um, kind of driving large tractors around fields um, and trying to uh, sort of treating the entire field as a, as a sort of single unit and, and treating it all in the same way. The model where you can use um, uh, small, much much smaller robots, um, kind of autonomously driving around the field, gathering data, and then sort of being able to act on that data um, at the per plant level uh, and really sort of change farming from, from something which is which is done sort of with single treatment, single sort of uh, um, single single treatments at the, at the scale of fields down to the sort of treatment of the, of the individual plants. Um, so the the concept is sort of, you know, as I said, the, these robots, and really it's around, it's a, a, about trying to, um, move farming forward from to where it is now uh, in a sort of on a very unsustainable footing uh, to um, a place where uh, you can continue to farm at the scale you need to to be able to feed everyone, but do that in a way that is actually sustainable and allows the um, allows the sort of regenerative agriculture to become become a reality. Um, so, one of the sort of major issues with with farming today is the sheer level of inputs that the farm that farming requires um you have to um kind of apply vast large quantities of fertilizer to the whole field um often kind of in a, in a sort of very uh sort of blanket fashion um and you tend to have to sort of do things like apply apply fertilizer um kind of you know regardless of where whether it's sort of needed in every part of the field um simply because that's how the, how the technology exists to to be able to apply it um, and you get all sorts of problems like sort of fertilizer runoff causing um, causing problems downstream, um, kind of affecting affecting waterways, algal blooms, and so on. Um, so you have to um, uh, we, want, we want to be able to move this move move this from kind of a, a problem of kind of single people operating tractors trying to trying to um, run it to over a whole field at, at sort of at scale and speed to down to this sort of pre precise way of doing things. Um, so our goal, as I, as I said, I was going to provide actionable insights at the per plant level um, and try to create an alternative to this sort of blanket application of, of chemicals. Um, the results that we have uh, from uh, the sort of the, the, the current the last few years we've been we've been running a service for farmers where we go into the into the fields with robots and survey their fields um, sort of suggest that we can uh, make significant savings for farmers across um, kind of their inputs of both fertilizers and herbicides simply by 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 scanning what's in the fields and then being able to take decisions based on this extremely high resolution imagery of what's in the fields and allow them to use um, initially their existing machinery. Uh, to then be able to, to, to apply their fertilizer and herbicide in a, in a, in a, in a sort of much more fine-grained and, and controlled way. Uh, so this is just a quick video of, of the uh, the robots um, operating. This, uh, this is these are our robots at our headquarters uh, in Porton near Salisbury. Um, so this is our uh, Tom Bernard Ball robot, uh, which is a it's a modular robotic platform, um, which here is set up to do a field survey. So it has a boom with cameras on it. Um, and those are taking images of uh, a field, uh, so high resolution images of the of the entire field. So the robot can operate autonomously, uh, driving up and down uh, over the crop and bring back a data set, which is um, sort of of the order of, of a terabyte or more for a uh, sort of 20 hectare field. Um, and is sort of able to do that consistently over, over um, the course of sort of multiple days and multiple fields. Uh, so this is the kind of imagery we get from the um, from the robots, and then we have machine learning models, object detection models, which run over that imagery to be able to detect individual crop plants, individual weeds, uh, and then provide maps for the farmer showing where those weeds are, where the crops are, um, and then generate treatment maps, uh, which the farmers can then use. Um, now, the treatment maps that we can produce at the moment, uh, we're deliberately producing treatment maps which are compatible with farmers' existing machinery. So where they have sectional controlled sprayers, for example, for spraying fertilizer on their field, 
then we can um, kind of take the data we've got from our, from our field survey and then use that to spray um, sort of just where, uh, where, where there's areas where, 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 for example, herbicide is needed. Um, the vision is to move even beyond that and go from um, kind of controlling existing machinery to using this modular robotic platform, uh, not only to, uh, to be able to take images of the field and survey the field, but also to then take action. Um, so we've got um, sort of, sort of early prototypes of systems for doing things like non-chemical weeding, where you um, take, uh, you can sort of, if you can geolocate an individual weed, you can drive a robot to it and then take some action on it. Um, we have a, uh, a, a sort of a prototype project um, using a um, uh, electric weeding one that sort of zaps the weed electricity, um, uh, which is sort of you know it, it's a it's a potential a potential way of uh, of kind of being able to treat the weed without using any chemicals at all. Um, so uh, yeah, the, the the stages of the project, as I say, are to first of all survey the field, geolocate every single plant in that field um, with sort of um, kind of extremely high spatial resolution. Um, then to use that data to optimize existing farm machinery, uh, allow the farmers to get the, the best best use out of the machinery they've already got, but ultimately to be able to sort of take this take, take beyond it and 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 actually apply um, apply chemicals exactly where they're needed at sort of extremely high uh, sort of fine fine grain resolution. Uh, so the Tong V4 robot, which I mentioned, um, is uh, sort of the uh, the current generation of our of our of our robot. Um, the um, the, the boom you can see here set of it has eight cameras along its length, um, each of which is taking um, sort of a, a high resolution Im image with a ground sample distance that is um, sort of the, the size of a pixel um, that's imaged on the ground is, is, is just, uh, just over a quarter of a millimeter. Um, the ground pressure um, is very important from the point of view of um, kind of reducing soil compaction. So tractors tend to be uh, very heavy um, and can kind of, you know, will 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 have uh, you know significant soil compaction, especially sort of along the tram lines where they where they normally run. The um, ground pressure of a Tom robot is roughly similar to that of a human foot walking on the field, so it's much much lower. Um, and we can run the robot in wheat crops uh, up to um, kind of what's uh, what's known as growth stage thirty one, which is the point at which they sort of start to um, send up. Uh, the, uh, the, the the long uh, stems, uh, so we can kind of get a, a fairly a, a good a good view of the field um, over much of the growing cycle of the of the um, uh, of, of a wheat crop, for example, uh, by sort of just running be able to run the robot over it, um, and then the robot can uh, sort of it's, it's powered by batteries and can sort of run up and down a field following a, a preset map um, and cover about uh, just over two hectares in an hour. So. As I mentioned before, uh, the goal ultimately is to move to per plant action as well as per plant, um, uh, per, per plant imaging and, and sort of intelligence. Uh, this is just an example of this uh, this electric weeding prototype, uh, which is using um, the the maps generated by by the sort of the field survey robot, and then some onboard computer vision to be able to sort of geolocate exactly where that weed is, um, and then zap it. Um, so that's that's where we're going. Um, this is the uh, sort of the, uh, the, the the lineage of our robots. Um, the V4, as I said, of the current iteration, uh, we've gone through sort of multiple cycles of this, starting with a fairly small robot, an even, even smaller robot that was uh, kind of with, with very small wheels, uh, with a very early prototype, uh, through to the, the, the version two, uh, and uh, then the, the version three robots, which we've been using until recently, uh, sort of very capable. Um, but the, 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 cr the critical thing with sort of the, the version four is that it's now extremely modular. Um, and very configurable, which means it's very easy to sort of um, to take this same sort of this, the same building blocks here and then to kind of reconfigure quickly for, for other applications. Um, the question we get a lot is why are you using robots and not just doing this using drones, uh, for example? Um, so the the argument is that if you are if you want to get um, high resolution Im resolution imagery at sort of field scale, but at plant resolution, then it's much much more efficient uh, to be actually just driving a robot over the crop than it is to be um, taking a drone. Because a drone, you have to sort of fly it very low, then the image a very small area at a time, and we'll have to sort of you know, do mo multiple passes over, over the fields. Um, battery life becomes a significant issue uh, when you're doing that. You have to, to have, probably have to have multiple. Or many many battery changes uh, a drone to be able to get the sort of same resolution imagery. 
Um, in addition, we've also got extremely controlled conditions for doing our, our imaging here. So we've got um, the cameras at a sort of standard height from the ground. We've got lighting that enables us to kind of um, get consistent uh, imagery, uh, regardless of uh, sort of weather conditions as well. Uh, so there's there's lots of benefits to um, to be to, to using these these, these robots. Um, the alternative is systems which are mounted on tractors, uh, and there's sort of various of these which are um, coming onto the market um, now. The interesting um, thing about these is there's, there's sort of systems for doing um, uh, our, our systems are looking at um, looking at individual plants. There are systems, there are tractor mounted systems right now which can kind of basically say, is there something green in my field, and, and therefore should I spray it, um, and can sort of do that um, sort of on the fly, which is useful for doing things like if you're um, before you before you drill your, your 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 crop, you may want to do a kind of herbicide pass over the entire field. Farmers often often do that, um, and you can just apply herbicide kind of on things which are still green in your field, for example. Um, but uh, it's it's kind of you know, this 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 imaging platform allows us to do move move beyond that and move into the, the green on green, where you're actually spotting individual individual crops. Um, the other benefit of do, doing multiple passes is that if you're, um, for example, running a sprayer over the fields. And you're sort of trying to do detection of where you should be spraying and spraying at the same time you still have to make up a full tank of chemical because you don't know how much to feel you're going to end up spraying and that stuff you can't put back in the bottle or anything it has to kind of it, get, it gets wasted um so the the benefits of doing a kind of multi-pass process are sort of significant in terms of in, saving of inputs um okay so uh this is an example of our sort of field scale uh, per plant data. We've got um, one of the images, like, as I showed you before, uh, this is a real image from one of our robots. This has been a um, winter wheat crop, um, which is sort of um, uh, in, uh, yeah, this is kind of probably taken, I would imagine, in sort of early spring. Um, and you can see the sort of yellow and uh, just about for hopefully see the sort of light blue boxes there are where we've detected individual weeds. Um, in this case, actually, are weeds of different species with the different colored boxes uh, on this image. So um, we can, as you can see, kind of get very, very good, um, good quality, high, high resolution images, and which allows us to kind of pinpoint those those individual weeds um, and give us a map of an entire field showing kind of what the weed density is, where the problem areas are, um, and where are the areas which are sort of sensible for the for the for the farmer to be treating. Um, the other Big application um, beyond uh, herbicide is is to look at variable rate application of fertilizer, particularly nitrogen fertilizer. Um, so the image on the left here is a uh, the, the map we we would give to a farmer to put into their sectional controlled sprayer, for example, uh, to do variable rate nitrogen application. We have a number of different inputs to that. So one of these is um, the crop plant counts themselves. So here we're we're running our object detection models over these over these images to detect the individual crop plants and count the um the number of crop, crop plants in a, in a given area get a, a crop density map um the other part of this is that we can couple this um with a uh a sort of an overall assessment of the of the biomass in a, in a given area so it's when the crop's just emerging it's relatively easy still to be able to kind of spot the individual plants um once you start getting uh, to the point where the leaves are spreading over each other, it's much, much more difficult to have a model which is actually kind of capable of, of, of disentangling those individual plants. Um, but you can couple the kind of early stage emergence uh, counts for the, uh, for the plants and kind of get, you know, those, those won't change that much once the, part, once the crop has emerged. Couple those with this sort of overall assessment of, of the biomass based on um, a measure called green area index, which is essentially how much green, how, how many... How, how much leaf area is there within sort of a square meter? So that can potentially go above one if you've got multiple overlap, overlapping leaves. And there's, there's sort of good ways of, uh, sort of, of, of measuring that in a fairly, fairly robust way uh, using the imagery that we can get. Uh, so we can combine those two um, to, uh, to provide a, 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 a nitrogen application map for farmers. Now, the interesting thing is that opinions on how you should apply those nitrogen maps uh, often differ. So, for example, you have areas of, of low emergence um, then some farmers will say, okay, well, I'll just write that off, area, write off that area and forget about it. Other farmers will say, actually, I want to add it, apply extra nitrogen because I want the crops to the left to grow more. Um, and the, there's no strong consensus among, amongst, amongst farmers about which you should be doing. But if you have this data, then it allows you to actually start to do proper sort of controlled trials of, of these sorts of things and, and sort of really um, get, get much more quantitative about it. 
Um, cool. So I'll just go briefly into the um, uh, the details of our sort of the, how we generate these these plant maps. So um, as I as I showed you before, the Tom robot has this this boom with eight cameras on. They take um, overlapping images, which sort of overlap by by a small amount. Um, yeah, sort of along the boom, and then the robot drives at a at a given speed, and the cameras will fire uh, based on the speed the robot's going. Uh, in order to kind of sort of images with a nice uniform overlap, uh, so that we can kind of image the entire uh, entire entire field without um, sort of without too much um, sort of extraneous data. Um, in addition to the cameras, the robots have a have a um, high quality GPS system, so an RTK GPS um, system, which gives you um, um, kind of you know ex extremely high resolution um, uh, positioning, and that allows us to then. Um, position those, uh, those those images um, kind of exactly in space. Um, we then have a number of different object detection models which we run on those images to be able to detect the individual crop plants within them, and then you can obviously map that back to give you sort of the, the exact spatial location of the um, of the plants or the crop plants or the, or the weeds, whatever it might be. Um, so that's the the sort of the, the basic pipeline. So obviously behind that we have. Um, a, a number of these machine learning models that we're running at scale over the entire data set. Um, so these are, um, we're sort of, there's, there's a, a large family and ever growing kind of zoo of object detection models, um, which uh, are sort of being rapidly, the, the safety art is developing very rapidly. It's sort of nice to be able to just widen the coattails of all of the, uh, the great research that's going on in academia and kind of just pick the pick the best models from the, from the, from the bunch, but essentially, the, the, the regardless of the exact model we're using, using the, the pipeline remains the same, which was we take our, our raw images from the robots. Um, we have a sort of a team of experts who, who are extremely uh, skilled at labeling these images uh, quickly and effectively. Um, we sort of got in-house in agronomists and, and sort of other expertise in, in, in our team um, at labeling um, sort of these, these, uh, these images quickly. And so we've got an ever-growing corpus of, of, of labeled imagery. Uh, so we've got label data sets for uh, for counting individual plants, uh, wheat sort of at different growth stages, um, and uh, and the individual uh, and the individual weeds. Most of our data sets for weed detection are kind of just is this a broadleaf weed or or not? Um, we have sort of some labeled data where we're looking at the weed species classification per species classification. There's some interesting challenges around that uh, because um, there's a big uh, data set imbalance in that case because you get lots and lots of one, spe one, one particular species of weed and very few of another and in general you find more of the weeds which farmers are more tolerant of and fewer of the weeds which farmers are less tolerant of um, which is an interesting challenge but we'll get into that later um, but essentially we have this ever -growing, these ever-growing uh, corpora of images and can then train uh, our object detection models uh, on those. This is just an example of one of the models we use. Retina Net is um, this slide used to say retina is among the state of the art models for object detection, and the field moves so quickly that I had to remove that line from the slide because it's it's rapidly been surpassed. Um, but is it still a high quality um, uh, object detection model? The, the the model itself is a convolutional uh, neural network um, which is taking in all of the image pixels at the, uh, at, at, the at the input layer, and then has um, a a setup called the feature pyramid network, which is essentially kind of like doing a, a multi-scale analysis of, of the image. And that has two uh, heads to it. One uh, network is predicting uh, the label for, for, for the image, and the other is predicting kind of like the, the, the corners of the bounding block, essentially, for, for where um, where an object is. And so there's those two kind of heads work in parallel to be able to say, okay, there's, there should be a bounding box at this spatial location in the image, and it should have this label. Um, so be that kind of you know, the weed species or whatever it might be. Um, so yeah, this is this is proven to be a, a kind of nice robust architecture for us, us to be used for, for many of these um, these applications. Um, one of the nice things about Resident Net is that it tends to uh, be good at dealing with many, many small objects uh, in an image. One of the sort of interesting features of, of object detection models, they tend to be tuned, the, or at least the hyperparameters of these models tend to be tuned towards the kind of data sets that, that people are um, are used to working on, which are often um, kind of smaller numbers of fairly large objects in, in an image. Um, so this is quite an interesting kind of you know, different application that's, that's, that's quite um, quite a different environment to, 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 to many of these sort of academic, the, um, 
sort of standard research data sets which are out there. And actually come to that later because we, we're sort of trying to push some more agricultural data sets onto into the, into the sort of academic machine learning community as a sort of, you know, okay, okay here's, here, here's a new challenge problem for you kind of thing, um, which is which is fun. Um, cool. So the, the next thing is the data pipeline. Uh, so obviously, if we've got uh, sort of multiple terabytes of data coming back from the field, uh, we need to kind of get that get that processed. At the moment, uh, the way this works is the robots go out and they just store all the data as they go. Uh, so we get uh, some disks back from the from the robot. Um, we have the option of either processing stuff locally on site or depending on the amount of internet connection you've got, getting stuff up to the cloud. Obviously, it's kind of we prefer to do things in cloud because keeping lots and lots of servers running uh, is challenging and nice to make it someone else's problem. Um, so um, yeah, in general, we try and do our analysis in the cloud um, using kind of data pipelines, which which are able to parallelize these things as much as possible. This is largely an embarrassingly parallel problem because we have lots and lots of images, all of which can process independently of one another, and that's the kind of the really heavy step in, in the process. And then there's you know, lots of, and then the final thing is just bring bring all of the uh, all the data from multiple uh, multiple images together. Um, so, yeah, there's there's a sort of a, a clear kind of pyramid of data coming in. So we've got sort of you know four hundred thousand individual images or something um, from a twenty hectare survey, um, one and a half terabytes of raw data, and we are running our detection models over those, finding the individual locations of plants and so on. Um, and but the final the final data that's actually shared with farmers is only sort of a few megabytes of data by the time you get to a sort of treatment map or a, or a map of the entire field. Um, but it's kind of you know having the given the right the right data that's the, that's the important thing. Um, so I'll I want to touch briefly on um, this uh, uh, point I made earlier about about sort of the, the challenges of um, uh, of or the, the data, some of the data challenges that we that we, we suffer from. So um, one is that we can only la label so much of the data coming back from our robots. Um, if we've got a nice, a, an amazing instrument that's able to kind of gather as essentially unbounded quantities of data, but getting that data labeled is um, is a challenging problem. Um, requires you know experts spending time drawing boxes on images to say say where the uh, uh, where the where the individual plants are. Um, now. That's fine. It works. You know, it works well enough. We have plenty of plenty of data coming in. But one of the interesting questions is: Can we? Um, how can we make better use of the unlabeled data, uh, as well as the labeled data? So one of the sort of active areas of research interest for for the for, for the team is around uh, using semi supervised learning techniques, where you're, you combine smallish labeled data sets with very large unlabeled data sets and try and make use of use of both of them simultaneously. Um, now. The the benefits of doing that are we we hope that we can do things. And so this is this is the class imbalance problem I mentioned earlier when you're looking at kind of for example weed species identification. So um, this is you know, if you take 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 an example labeled data set, then then here we have sort of actually it's nice that one of one of the more the more sort of potentially pernicious weeds is actually the one that's most most represented in the data set. But many of the sort of pernicious weeds are also kind of way down this distribution. Um, and kind of getting enough labeled examples of some of those species um, that you really do want to be able to spot um, can be challenging. So um, there's sort of, you know, that we um, recently pre uh, printed this uh, poster, which I'm not expecting to read all the details of, um, at a conference um, where we sort of were essentially floating this new data set out, out, out of the community and saying, here is an example of kind of a roughly a thousand labeled images, um, and then sort of another hundred thousand unlabeled images, um, uh, and sort of presenting this as a challenge, a challenge data set for the community essentially, uh, with some initial results showing that if you use uh, some sort of existing uh, uh, semi-supervised learning techniques uh, on, you can kind of get um, fairly, fairly good improvements in, in, the, in the performance of the model just by sort of even even just by using a fairly small slice of that unlabeled data. Um, so the the technique that they were, were using in this case uh, was sort of teacher student learning, where you have a, a model that sort of bootstraps itself using the labeled data, uh, and so will then predict um, predict on on some of the unlabeled data and where it's got high confidence in its predictions on the unlabeled data, you can then sort of feed those back into the um, into the training data set and uh, gradually allow it to sort of make use of more and more of the unlabeled data. Um, so uh, this is kind of interesting because this this was a result which which was you know we showed we showed some some, some progress on this using a small amount of the uh, of the data set, but 
the interesting thing now, hopefully, is that this this data set kind of gains some traction in the community, and we get to kind of you know ride on the coattails of all, of, of, of all the all the ex, all the all the uh, the uh, all the massive kind of amount of research that's currently going on in the, in object detection uh, models. Cool. So um, just want to touch briefly on the, on the sort of application, which is of particular interest to farmers at the moment. Uh, and this is grass weed detection. Um, so here we have um, farmers have a significant issue with uh, with, with grass weeds um, in their in their wheat crops, especially and wheat, wheat and barley crops. Um, so these are grasses, uh, sort of like black grass and, and brome, um, which are sort of other species of grass which which will grow uh, along with the crop and tend to outcompete the crop in, uh, in sort of areas of the field. Um, the challenge is that they are um, because they're uh, sort of very similar uh, genetically to the to the crop. It's much more difficult to find a uh, find a good uh, herbicide that will that will um, selectively remove the grass weeds. And there's there's very few of them, and they are rapidly losing their effectiveness. Um, so farmers have to resort to techniques like actually kind of like hand roguing, go going into the field and removing large clumps clumps of black, black grass by hand if they want to avoid spread of it um, over the course of sort of multiple growing seasons. Um, now. The nice thing is about the imagery that we the, the image that we, we're using for our, getting from our robots. Um, you can uh, spot these grass weeds within the crop at sort of ridiculously early growth stage, um, which is uh, sort of very exciting uh, for, for for ours and also kind of the farmers that we can show that we show this is results to have been kind of very impressed with, with our ability to kind of go and go and spot these individual grass weeds. So the kind of thing we're talking about is. You know, though those pixels there um, are an emerging uh, black grass plant in a in a in a wheat crop, um, and um, with a combination of of the, the high resolution imagery and the extremely accurate uh, eyes of uh, our <laughs> experts, who um, the uh, there's a number of people on the team who who spend a long a lot of time in the field and have got really got their eye in on this problem of identifying these these things. So you can we can build data sets, uh, train data sets, which are um, kind of good, you know, good enough to be able to actually detect these these grass weeds um, at field scale. And um, so, uh, at the moment, this early stage model is, is sort of performing at about sixty five accuracy against an expert agronomist. Um, but we have kind of fairly good, high confidence that that as we build these data sets more and more, we'll be able to kind of rapidly push that so that performance up to the point where it's actually kind of um, it's it's kind of going to be consistently valuable across across multiple fields for the uh, for the farmers. Um, as an aside on that, the way that we evaluate these models um, is uh, typically using precision recall curves. Um, so, if you're um, detecting, it's, say you want to detect grass weeds in, in a crop, um, you can sort of characterize your model's performance in terms of its its precision and its recall. That is, the re recall is what proportion of all the grass weeds in the field does the, does the model uh, successfully identify? And the precision is um, what proportion of the detections it made were, were correct. And obviously, you want to get um, the recall as high as possible um, and the precision high as, as high as possible, but there will be some trade-off between them. Um, so you can sort of essentially say, I would provide a, you know, give a threshold to, um, I'll take all the detections above some confidence level that my model makes and uh, class those as, as, as grass weeds, for example, and then everything else um goes uh uh it is 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 rejected um now the, the nice thing is that if you do that you can sort of build this build this curve which essentially shows um kind of what the trade-off is between those two variables and you can pick an operating point on that curve and say okay well if i want to spot clusters of, of grass weeds of above a certain size and i want to be able to do that kind of across the field you can sort of you can start to to sort of work directly with the farmers and say okay well what what constitutes kind of like success as far as as far as the model's concerned and, and and sort of what would you what would you hope that we'd be able to spot and 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 what would you what how is that how is that better or how can we operate this better than what you would do by eye sort of thing and even if a model is not performing perfectly you can still sort of often find a point on that curve where it's kind of like going to be of value to uh to the partner which is uh which is exciting so i think that's uh everything on grass weeds i've actually rolled through these slides very fast um I've got one or, one or two more, but uh, I can always go back and, uh, and and take some questions as we go. So um, the service that stands at the moment that we're providing to farmers uh, right now is three of these Tom robot surveys over the course of a growing season. 
Um, and this is in, in wheat, which is the, uh, the largest, largest crop um, by, by area in the UK. Um, specifically winter wheat, which is, um, goes in the ground in, in October. It sort of um, grows slowly over the winter, um, uh, sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's resistant to frost and, and, and so on. And then, and then once it gets to the spring, kind of really takes off. Um, that's the vast majority of, of wheat grain in this country. Some farmers will, will put some in the spring as well, but essentially it's, um, it's sort of mostly goes in, in the winter. Um, so the first survey um, happens before, they, before the crops go, crop goes in the ground. Um, sort of late, uh, you know, early, early autumn, um, and that is just doing uh, green and brown detection. So it's just saying, um, yeah, this is the simplest, simplest from a computer vision point of view, because then she just want to spot the green pixels in your image and then go produce a map of those. Um, so that's uh, you know, relatively relatively easy from uh, from sort of machine learning point of view. Um, but that is still provides an extremely valuable map because it allows uh, you to sort of say, okay, well, where do I need to spray? Um, if you want to do a, a pre uh, pre drill herbicide application, then where do you need to spray? Um, and as I mentioned, you you then only need to make up as much chemical as you as you actually need to spray on the field because you know in advance where that is. The second survey is um, uh, we, we that, this is the one where we sort of you know, we, we go all out with all, all all of the models on really. Um, we do broad diff weed detection um, across the entire field. And a uh, herbicide um, to, to get to herbicide treatment map as well. Yeah. When is that second? Uh, so that is sort of post emergence. Um, that happens in about November or so, uh, once the crops kind of uh, emerge, but is not is not massive. So you can still count individual individual crop plants. Um, but there's enough time passed that if the, the farmer has done a uh, sort of pre emergence herbicide spray, then you'll get some weed emergence. You can start to see where your clusters of weeds are, are showing up. Um, and then, um, yeah, a, and then the next one of those is, is crop count, um, which then informs where the um, where so there's there's sort of um, a number of different high, uh, nitrogen applications over the course of the growing season. Um, N1 first nitrogen application, and N2 the, the second the second one they do. This one informs both of them because it says, okay, what's my what's my um, plant density over the entire field, and are there areas which are sort of performing badly, performing well, and so on. Um, and those are um, those once the crops emerge, those those don't really change that much. So you can kind of like get a fairly good idea about you know the number of plants that you've got in the ground uh, come, that have actually successfully emerged is going to be reasonably well correlated with the number of plants that kind of that continue to grow. Um, and then the final survey again, we do broadleaf weed detection. Um, this is kind of this happens in sort of early spring um, when the crops are about growth stage thirty one. Um, which is the point at which we, the, it's the the individual wheat plants are now kind of massively overlapping um, and very difficult to tell apart, but you can still spot weeds um, sort of in amongst them. Um, so this kind of you know allow, allows us to see what the spread of weeds has been between um, kind of kind of you know, November sort of time and, and early, early spring. Are there areas which are where the weeds are getting particularly out of hand and so on? Uh, and then they can do another another herbicide application then. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the screen area index thing allows us to kind of look at the the overall plant biomass in the field, um, which gives you another input to allow to, to, to inform your fertilizer application. So we can kind of combine the, the, the plant counts in the first from the second survey and the, and the sort of biomass assessment from the third survey uh, to give a give a fertilizer recommendation. Um, so yeah, this, so this is this is now live on um, uh, thirteen or the twenty twenty three. Um, uh 2022 to 2023 growing season being live on, on on 13 farms um and kind of giving the farmers treatment maps to use directly with their uh, equipment it's been kind of nice looking on sort of <laughs> some of our farmers into posting posting themselves in 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 their uh in their, sort of their spraying equipment on twitter uh showing how oh look i'm using a small rubber company spray map to do my uh, do my thing which is, which is exciting um so um these are kind of you know it's it's actually working in the field and farmers are getting value from this which is which is really nice nice to see um so yeah as, as i mentioned we've got sort of a quite a nice a large community of sort of the the earlier adopter farmers who are sort of you know happy to experiment a little bit and and sort of can see the the benefits of the system as 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 time progress so time goes on and sort of are getting in on getting in on it as, as early as they can um and um you know and starting to see benefits from it which is uh, which is it's exciting right um 
To change that completely, uh, just as a further final side, we've also got a number of um, kind of interesting R&D projects going on uh, on the side. Um, so these are um, kind of some of the projects which we've worked on at various times. These are sort of collaborative projects with, with other kind of people in industry and also in academia. Um, we had a nice project um, uh, uh, about a year or so ago, um, which was uh, looking at spotting slugs. Um, and um, potentially being able to kind of um, uh, basically sort of precision, do, do precision sp spraying of slugs with some sort of um, biomolusticide. That's something which, you know, which, which, isn't, which isn't just a um, kind of standard chemical you put on slugs, but actually kind of involves nem nematodes, which, uh, which will go and attack the slug directly. Uh, you can't spray that at scale because it's quite an expensive um, thing to do, but it's um, a lot safer and doesn't kind of, you know, lead to lots, lots of, uh, lots of, chem lots of, undesirable chemicals going on and going onto your field. Um, so that was a, an interesting project and, and kind of uh, fun to kind of try and get the, the entire system working end to end, essentially kind of like combining the, the, the vision systems to be able to spot slugs uh, all the way through to sort of spray systems to be able to actually uh, actually go and uh, go and spray them in an area. And the other one, as I mentioned, is just non-chemical weeding, uh, which again is about uh, taking some sort of actuator and getting it to exactly the right point to be able to take an action on, on a weed. So those are um, kind of, you know, both, Nice early stage proof points of kind of being able to um, being able to being able to take action, be able to, be able to perform detections and move all the way through to action, and that's sort of really where we're where we're heading for. What sort of action do you to take? So at the moment we've got um, yeah the, the the sort of targeted spraying is, is one of them, and then the other one at the moment is is being able to essentially move something directly over the weed and in this case kind of like just just zap it with electricity but yeah. you could oh, right. we've got the you know we've, we've now got got that capability to be able to move an actuator above a weed um and then you know we can work in progress to determine kind of like you know what the what the what the right actuator for the job is essentially um uh but sort of the the, the fundamentals are, are kind of are, are there and demonstrated which is which is nice um i think that's all my slides <laughs>